has been showing us many amazing weapons in the last 21 years, and they're not found in Ephesians 6. Uh, that's usually the go-to passage for the armor. We're going to, within the time we have, explore these new pieces of the armor, several of which are offensive weapons. Now think about that, because see, you know, I used to, you always used to hear, well, remember, we only have one offensive weapon, and that's the sword of the Spirit, the word of Yahuwah. Well, that isn't really true. There are other offensive weapons, and some of them are really major. So uh, we're going to see how you can empower yourself for the upcoming struggle. Now, the ones on your uh, left, I guess it would be, are the ones most people are aware of. The girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of the gospel of peace, helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit. Those are all pretty well known. But there are some new ones. First of all, you have the breastplate of faith and love. That's found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. Now that's an additional fortification beyond the breastplate of righteousness. Because, now think about this for a moment. Who is our righteousness? Christ, Yahushua, is our righteousness. And we have to have faith for that to really integrate itself into our armor. We have to love him. We have to serve him. And we, how do we show our love? By keeping his commandments. So all three of these things plug in to create a much more powerful breastplate. Then we have the garment of vengeance and the cloak of zeal. Those are both in Isaiah 59, 17. These are powerful because, again, I remember there used to be a joke that there's in the armor of God, there's nothing to cover your backside. That was a joke. Well, that's not really true. Because as everybody knows, if you wear a cloak, got you covered. If you wear a garment, it got, it, you, you're covered. And basically, these are spiritual things that we wear to cover our entire bodies. Zeal is, is just the fervor with which we love God, which we love His Word, and which we defend the truth. And of course, we know that the Scripture says, Vengeance is mine saith Yahuwah. But nevertheless, we can be a part of that in decreeing the spiritual, now for the spiritual realm, judgment upon these fallen angelic beings and taking vengeance upon them. Because you know, Paul says, know ye not that you will judge angels? We will be judging angels in the millennium. And there's some of them, boy, I can't wait. The fallen angels, of course. Then there's the garment of praise. Most people have heard of that, but they don't realize that's part of the armor. That's like a mantle that we wear, like the prayer shawl, the talit, and it encloses us with the joy of, of the Almighty. And it says what? The joy of Yahweh is our strength and has become our song and our salvation. Well, that's part of the garment of praise. Then we have the armor of light, Romans 13, 12. We're going to talk more about that in a minute because... That is the critical component to all of the armor. And if you don't have the armor of light, it's like you're fighting the devil with half a hand. You've got three-fourths of your arm tied behind your back, so to speak. Then we have more. We have the shield of salvation, Psalm 1835. And I don't have time to go into all these in depth because we've got more good stuff coming yet. The girdle of righteousness on our loins, the girdle of faith around our reins. Now, what does that mean? I got into talk about this just for a moment. The term loins normally refers to our reproductive faculties. And we need to have this girdle around them because as many people know, that's an area where many people fall into sin. Even men and women of Yahuwah, pastors, evangelists, whatever, they fall because of pornography, because of adultery, whatever it might be. So you need to have this girdle on at all times. You need to have the girdle of faith around your reins. The rein is actually your kidneys. And many people know if, you're in, if you've ever done boxing or martial arts or things like that, you want to take somebody down, you punch them hard in the kidneys. And that'll do it. So the girdle of faith is there to protect your kidneys, which are again kind of more in the rear part of the torso. Then we have the robe of righteousness and the large shield of favor. Uh, the robe of righteousness is Isaiah 61.10. The large shield of favor is Psalm 5.12. Now let me explain something here. This is something huge. Now back in the days of, you know, David, they didn't have tanks. 
But if they'd have had tanks or armored vehicles, that's what they would have said. This is something that covers everything. But you have to ask for it. And if you ask for it, it will be given you. And it's big enough to protect you and your family, the large shield of favor, just like you can get two or three guys inside of a tank, especially nowadays. I mean, I think I've seen pictures of some of these new tanks they've got, and they're huge. Then we have, here's an offensive weapon, the glittering spear of Yahuwah. That's Habakkuk 3.11. Now, you know, swords are cool, but spears are more long range. And if you've got somebody you're praying for or demons against in a person that's far away, you fire off the guided missile of the glittering spear of Yahuwah at them. And it'll be enormously effective. Then... We have an even better weapon, the battle axe of Yahuwah. It's Jeremiah 51.20. Now, let me tell you about this, because you all know what a battle axe looks like. We've seen movies with knights or whatever. It's a powerful, devastating weapon. You can chop off somebody's arm with it. I'll tell you what we use this for primarily. We use this for breaking unrighteous soul ties. And for those of you that might not know, a soul tie is that it's created by having unrighteous sexual relationships with somebody, you know, fornication uh, or adultery or homosexuality, anything like that, or even relationships of another kind. Like sometimes there's unrighteous soul ties between parent and child that has nothing to do with sex. It's not like there's been sexual abuse, but there's just something creepy between a mother and a child or a father and a child that may not be of a sexual nature, but it's just it's some kind of manipulative thing either the child's manipulating the parents or vice versa. So for breaking those unrighteous soul ties, use the battle axe of Yahuwah and the sword of the Spirit. Then we have the large shield and buckler of truth. That's another area of fortification over and above the large shield of favor. Now, we need to talk about the armor of light and how to be a light warrior. Many folks they'd read Romans 13 and just kind of sail by the armor of light as if they're not even aware of it. For years as a believer, I even us underestimated this critical weapon because I had not studied deep enough into it. We begin by reading in Genesis 1 that light, the Hebrew word for light is or, was the first thing that Yahuwah created after the heavens and the earth. And it's interesting to note that note that this light existed before he created the sun and the moon. Some people find that puzzling. But see, this was the primordial light that existed before there was any source of regular light. That's because of why? Because Yahushua is the light. He is the light of the world. The closest thing to a creation story in the New Testament we find is John 1. And in verse 4 and 5, it says this, In him, meaning Yahushua, was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So, and then in verse, uh, pardon me, in verse 9, it says, Yahushua was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What does that mean? That means that every person who is born, man or woman, they have a little flicker of this primordial light in them, like a pilot light, waiting to be lit, waiting for faith to come along and ignite it. So we all have this light, and some of us it's not much. When you get born again, it becomes more of a full-fledged flame. But when you commit to being a true soldier of the f cross, this flame turns into something amazing. It becomes a resurrection light and power of Yahushua flowing through your veins. It's, it's literally the same power that raised Yahushua from the dead is flowing through every blood vessel, every artery, every vein of your body. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Come on, you guys got to get excited now. This is important stuff. Most of the armor protects you from without. But this armor was made from the primordial light of creation that Yahushua was placed within it. It is something entirely different. It is an entirely new order of magnitude. This light is like a super-powered 
endoskeleton ready to power you to full victory in Messiah. Now you might say, well, what the heck is an endoskeleton? That's an endoskeleton. It, it literally means, I'm sorry, that's an exoskeleton. Yeah. yeah, lobsters, crustaceans, their bones are on the outside. If you've ever eaten a lobster, I hope you haven't because they're not kosher. But you'll notice there's nothing inside. It's all just gushy, you know. And th it's like a protective outer shell. That's what the full armor of Yahuwah is. It's an exoskeleton. But we and m mammals in general and a lot of vertebrates, in fact, that's what vertebrate means, they have skeletons, are on the inside. And the armor of light is like a spiritual endoskeleton. It supports us and gives us strength. Just like if you didn't have a skeleton, you know, yeah. you know you'd basically be a blob of protoplasm. You know, you'd be very relaxed. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> uh, but in the same way, without your armor of light, spiritually, you're kind of meh, you know. But with it, you have support and you have supernatural strength. There are some believers who are kind of like jellyfish. They don't put on the armor, and so they don't have an exoskeleton, and they don't put on their armor of light, so they have no endoskeleton. They're what Winston Churchill called a boneless wonder. Not good. But the armor of Yahuwah and the armor of light will give you both. And that's what you need to have. Once you understand this dynamic, you will be astonished what Yahushua can do for you in your life. You'll be protected both from within and, and pardon me, from without and empowered from within. Instead of being a suit of armor, think of it more like being Iron Man. I'm sure you've all at least heard of Iron Man. It's like, you know, huge in the theaters. Uh, his suit protects him, but it also gives him internal nuclear power and strength. So he can like pick up cars and punch people and all that kind of superhero stuff. The armor of light gives you the power from within, the spirit, to become a true overcomer. Now, the source of this power, some of it expected, you might think. Bible study, prayer, meditation on the word. But also, spiritually speaking, you are what you eat. You need the table of Yahuwah. This is very important. This is an oft-neglected yet incredible source of spiritual power. It's the fuel that powers your armor of light. Just like Iron Man has his nuclear reactor inside of his chest, well, you need this. There is much controversy over this ordinance, and one of its problems is frequency. Most churches either do it once a month or once a quarter at most. Some Messianic people only do it once a year at Passover. But is that really scriptural? In reports of the very early church, we're talking seriously earlier, folks. We're talking about Acts chapter 2. They continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and joy. And just so we understand here, the word for meat there is trophy in Greek, which means nourishment, ration, food, or meat. It just doesn't mean meat. It can mean their generalized food. And they continued daily. This is controversial, but the clear sense of the text seems to say they were doing it daily in their homes. Of course, in those days they were home churches because they didn't have churches like we do today. See, I believe the Protestants wanted to get so far away from Catholic superstition that they let the pendulum swing way too far the other way. And as many of you may know, Catholics, some of them, go to communion every day. They go to Mass every day and, and whatnot, you know. But what if you only ate your physical food once a month or once a quarter? You'd die of starvation. How powerful a warrior would you be? Imagine if you were fasting for a whole week and then you went into battle. You'd be like pretty much useless. We need to tread carefully here. This is a profound mystery. There is terrifying power in the table of Yahweh, and he can abuse it in two ways, just like we can abuse his name in two ways. We can take it in vain, take it without thought or heartfelt repentance casually, or we can neglect it by hardly ever doing it. You need your warrior food. Let me be very clear. I'm not talking about the Roman doctrine of transubstantiation, which means that the bread and wine literally becomes the body and blood of Yahushua, nor the Lutheran doctrine of consubstantiation, which means that somehow in some weird way the bread and the wine and the body and blood exist in the same thing at the same time, but they're not the same thing. I know, I didn't make it up, Luther did. These are heresies. The eschatological component is here too. That means the end times. Paul says, 
For as oft as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do shew the Lord's death till he comes. Think about that for a moment. That means whenever you take communion, you are remembering his death and preparing for his second advent. Note the word shew. I have a theory about this. See, sometimes the King James Bible will use the word show. Sometimes it will use the word shoe. I think it uses it for emphasis because when you shoe something, it is like you are shouting it out. So you are shouting out the Lord's death until he comes. Hallelujah. For as oft, he says. That means often. Don't you want to proclaim his death? And Yahushua said, do this in remembrance of me. Don't you want to remember him? Remember what he did on the cross? We need to talk for a moment about the miracle of Passover and the anamnesis. Now that anamnesis is a, is a Greek word, but it means to remember. You may see the word amnesia there, which means not to remember, obviously. See, in the Passover, and I don't know if you've ever been to a Passover Seder, but you should be doing that if you, if you haven't. In the Passover, Israelites are literally back with Moses in Egypt. It's an anamnesis. It's time travel. It's a remembrance of that moment when we were set free from the bondage of Egypt. And every year on Passover, we get reset free from the bondage of Egypt again because we dip back into time to the divine power of Yahuwah who is eternal. And the same thing happens with the table of Yahuwah. When we partake, we are momentarily back with Yahushua on Calvary. This is what in Hebrew is called a sod, a deep level mystery. In some way, our finite minds cannot comprehend the divine table takes us back to Calvary. This is how we shout Yahushua's death until he comes. In the same wonderful fashion, when we partake of the elements, we are endowed with a much greater measure of his divine power, wisdom, and love. This is a power meal because we are what we eat. When we do this, more often we find we can truly do all things through Christ because he strengthens us. We can truly walk with him and overcome with him. We can have victory in our lives and the power to truly endure to the end. It greatly amplifies this resurrection power flowing through our veins. But we do need to be careful. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul warns us not to eat or drink unworthy. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So must be thoughtful then, and examine ourselves before we do this. What does it mean to discern the Lord's body? Well, nobody knows entirely, but I would submit to you that you pray and seek the Spirit about this. Some levels of meaning would include not discerning, knowing and loving others in the body of Christ, not responding to their needs or their cries. Because when one member suffers, all members suffer. You know. Also, not realizing what you do to another believer, we do to Yahushua. And sometimes we can be very cruel to one another. We can gossip, we can backbite. You know, won't even go there. This is the power of his light. You need to seek the Spirit deeply about this. There is much more that could be said, but that's a whole other teaching. If you have a church you're going to, how often does the pastor offer the divine table? If not very often, you need to nudge him in the right direction. If you don't have a church home, do it with your family. Now, finally, we're going to talk, unfortunately, very briefly about bringing heavenly power into your dreams. We all know that dreams are an important element in Bible and in prophecy, but there's much that's mysterious about them. I would submit to you that this is an enormous area for spiritual growth and empowerment. We need to approach it prayerfully and carefully. It's one-third of our lives. We spend a third of our life asleep. That adds up to a lot of time. What is the Spirit doing with us during that time, and can we optimize it? Many believers are attacked in their dreams. They have nightmares, they have night terrors, they have sleep paralysis, they have nocturnal attacks. Women are attacked, sometimes even men are attacked sexually, and it's scary stuff. It, it's nothing quite like it. What can be done? You should pray every night and ask the Holy Spirit to protect you and teach you how to fight back in your dreams. I don't have time to go into it in depth, 
but you can do it. It will happen. Um, a pastor I know years ago had walked in Pentecost his whole life. He said he used to have dreams where he was preaching. And a friend told him that lived in Russia, the other side of the world, that he had an experience where this man came and showed up at a prayer meeting and preached the same message that this pastor was preaching in his dreams around the world. I believe that happens more than we realize, especially as we walk deeper and deeper in the Spirit. Because remember, on this side of the world, when we're asleep, on the other side of the world, in China and whatnot, people are awake. If you open yourself up to this, you can be used to minister in the Spirit to others in your dreams. And of course, you can also prophetically have dream experiences. I know they're very familiar to your, your congregation here. How do you pray? Well, basically, um, you pray that, you know, Yahushua would protect you, would walk with you in your dreams, would send his angels to be with you in your dreams, and to not allow anything evil into your dreams to guard you and protect you and put a legion of mighty angels around your bedroom at night. Uh, practical tips. Read your Bible before you pray. Don't watch TV. Don't get on the internet because it makes your mind agitated. Keep as much electricity out of your bedroom as possible because Satan is the prince of the power of the air and he travels through electricity. Then there's the problem of mirrors. I don't know if you know this, but demons can travel through mirrors. They're doorways. That's why it's believed that it's unlucky to break a mirror because that will stop a demon from getting out of the mirror. That's where that superstition came from. So we advise people either A, to pray over and anoint their mirrors just as if they were anointing the doorpost to their house. If you have like a big vanity, you know, dresser type thing in your, in your um, bedroom. We don't even have a mirror in our bedroom. Uh, the blue light, you see, which this isn't spiritual, this is just physical, but people are finding that the blue light, which monitors and iPads and iPhones and stuff emits, and even digital clocks, helps keep you awake. So stay away from it. Pray over your dreams. You may already be an instrument of the Holy Spirit and simply not understand it. This may become an entire new field of ministry. The evil one can certainly attack us in our dreams, and many warriors of Yahweh have experienced this, but through the power of his name and his blood, we can fight back and claim the dream world for Yahushua and his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What an awesome man of God has come in to teach us all of this. And this is all important. These are some of the advanced things in Christianity. But now it's my job, my privilege here for just a moment to talk about the basics of Christianity. Step number one. You remember uh, one of the disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, <laughs> that's pretty cool. You know, the, the demons are subject to us in your name, Lord. He said, even more important, make certain that your name, rejoice that your yes. name is in the book of life. Yeah. Okay, so step number one is make certain. You go to heaven, make certain your name is in the book of life. So it's my job for the next couple of minutes to make certain that you understand how to do it. But now, and at the end of this, I'm going to ask everybody to pray a prayer. But I need to tell you that prayer won't get you to heaven because Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of the Father. In other words, this prayer is a first step. Only you can put your name in the book of life and only you can take your name out of the book of life. This prayer puts it there. But in one of the uh, angel visits that, where the angel came to Dimitri, he showed him the book of life. Showed him his name and his children, his family's names in the book of life. But then he pulled out the pen. And one end of the pen was a writing instrument. On the other end was an eraser. And he said, some of the names you see written here, obviously not from his family, but some of the names in this book will be erased and others will be written in. In other words, it is your choice. Each one of us has to make that decision ourselves. So I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures. I'm going to show you how to take the first step. But it's only a first step. After that, then you have to read that King James Bible, and you read it really for the rest of your life. I would recommend an hour a day. That would keep the demons away. 
<laughs> this is a start. Okay, so how do we make the start? First of all, the scripture, everybody already knows, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, that whosoever should believe in him would... That's right, okay. So that's the really easy one. That's what, Hey, we love that one. Okay, so how do we do it? First, we have to realize uh, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So we have to realize we are a sinner. I don't know about you, but in my case, that was pretty easy to realize. <laughs> I realized I had messed up, okay? Next thing is we have to realize we cannot buy a seat in heaven. We cannot buy the glorified body. We can't give enough in the offering. We can't do enough for the poor. You do not earn your way to heaven. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so if it's not of works, if it's a free gift, how do we reach out and take that gift? Romans 10, 9 and 10 gives us a simple answer. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That means it's not enough to say Jesus is Lord and not believe it. It's not enough to believe he's Lord and not say it. And that's the reason somebody comes up and puts a gun up to your head and say, you believe in Jesus, you die. We can't say, oh, well, uh, you know, the guy was going to kill me. Uh, so I had to deny him. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Matthew 10, 32 and 10, 33 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. A Christian cannot deny Jesus. We can't take the mark of the beast either. We're not going to do either. Finally, Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the washing away of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, what does that mean? It means that repent, we turn from our old ways. We don't be like the dog that gets sick and throws up and returns to the vomit. We don't be like the sow that gets washed off and returns to the mud. Instead, when we get this new life, this new lease, this new chance in life, when we ask Jesus into our heart, then from then on, we turn from the vomit and we don't go back. We turn from the sin and we don't go back. That's what it's saying. That's repent. And then we go get water dunked. That's not a sprinkle. That's holy dunked. When, you're die, when you die, do they just sprinkle you? Or do you get totally put under the ground? I hope it's not sprinkled. Okay? Same thing with this. It's a picture of being buried with him in the likeness of his burial we bury with him we live with him consequently now here comes the prayer it's real simple real easy i'm asking everyone to say it again with me bow our heads close eyes all say it together dear heavenly father, dear heavenly father I, admit I admit i'm a sinner and i confess with my mouth and i believe in my heart that jesus is the christ the son of the living god died on the cross arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father. I receive His blood to wash my sins away, to write my name in the book of life, to keep me holy, and to save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, it's important that you do Matthew 10, 33, confess it to someone else. Do this, read the King James, follow it, follow the will of God, and I'll see you in heaven. God bless.